Welcome to Behind the Smoke Podcast, Barbecue War Stories. My name is Sean Walchef with Cali Comfort Barbecue. We are recording Above the Butcher Shop. It's our special uh, Super Bowl episode, episode number 91. Here with my man Derek Marceau from Valley Farm Market. What's up, Derek? Not much, not much. Uh, didn't know we were going to do a Super Bowl episode, but I guess, um, you know, what better way than to do it when uh, we got a bunch of stuff going on and a bunch of barbecue. So uh, it, it's great to, to be able to do something and talk about something that's happening. And, uh, you know, it's pretty, pretty exciting. Got a bunch of good games and I'm excited to watch it. Yeah, it's going to be uh, obviously as a barbecue restaurant, we're gearing up. We're going to have a busy, busy Sunday and also as a butcher shop. I know you guys are going to be ready to go to help people so that they can uh, cook their barbecue meats and yeah. a lot of prepared stuff as well. Yeah, it's a lot of um, trays. You know, we yeah. do a lot of uh, fruit trays, uh, veggie trays, meat and cheese trays, uh, pulled pork trays, just just stuff that people can just kind of grab and, and put on the uh, the table because a lot of times people don't want to, what, what, what we're seeing is that people don't want to do it all themselves anymore. They kind of want to just grab it and then put it out. Um, but the... You know, the connoisseur, they, they like to be out there grilling. So we still have stuff from carne asada, pollo asada, probably our biggest sellers. But Aloha Beef and Maui Ribs are catching up. Um, people are really liking that. They're doing like Hawaiian-style rice and throwing out a bunch of uh, Hawaiian-style meat. It's, it's pretty pretty killer. Yeah, so for us today, um, we have a very special guest, guest Heather Myers. Uh, Emmy, eight Emmy Awards. Eight? Eight. Jeez. Eight local Emmy Awards. I don't know how that happened, by the way. <laughs> we, we know how it happened, but... Um, <laughs> We're so fortunate to have you uh, behind the smoke for us, you know, as a barbecue restaurant and a butcher shop, you know, we've been fortunate um, to be able to do a lot of media appearances. And I think um, a lot of that's because of the charity work that we've done with our barbecue events. Uh, we met you up at the CW um, the first time. And one of the things that impressed me personally was your attention to detail and how much you cared about actually the event. And it seemed that you had done a lot of background even before you came out to say hello to me and Derek. Um, for us, that was just the beginning of the relationship. We obviously, uh, you guys, CW closed um, that location, but then uh, CBS 8 took over the CW. So now yes. you're a news anchor for CW San Diego. Right. You also do the weather for Channel 8. They have me doing everything, by the everything. way. So if you need your car washed, I've perfected <laughs> that in the mix of this too. There you go. Well, welcome to Behind the Smoke. Well, thank you so much for having me on. I thought maybe my excellent first impression was the fact that I would come out and like put down a whole rack of ribs right in front of you guys. That was impressive too. You know, a <laughs> lot, you know, some, some uh, news anchors, they're more willing to get their hands dirty than others. But um, one of the things, like I said, that I was always impressed with is how much you cared about the story and about what we were trying to do, um, raising money and, um, you know. A lot of people, some people, they, you know, they just go off of cue cards or they go off of things that their producers handed to them. Uh, it seemed like you really knew what you were, what you were, what you were talking about. Well, first of all, you guys are super impressive because of what you do in this community, not only feeding people, uh, without a doubt, the best barbecue around, both of you, and of course, Derek with the meat, but then you give back. I mean... I'm sure you've all done the math on what you give back to this community, mm -hmm. and that number has to be ridiculously high. And bringing smiles and putting together events, and when there's a charity thing, you all have your hand up first in it. And that has to be celebrated in this community. That Not everyone's doing that. You know, we we had a conversation last night with one of my buddies, and he was uh, kind of saying the same thing. And I was, was telling him that, you know what? I had this vision of what I was going to do in life, you know, fortunate enough to play in the NFL for a little bit. I was going to have big mansions, uh, tons of cars and do, do all these crazy things. Um, almost looked down on like my dad doing this business and you know, that he's like, but you know, making an honest living, it's, it's really, really important to do that. And I'm like, okay. I mean, not that I'm not making an honest living, but I, I get it. Being able to do this and give back to the community is 10 times more rewarding than I ever thought it was going to be. Um, you know, it's something that you have to be able to figure out how to enjoy your job because not every job just, you know, going to be amazing, but you have to figure out what makes you tick. And for me, I get more enjoyment out of watching other people succeed and do things than I do for my own success. And I didn't really realize that until I started doing it more and more and more. It's like the older you get, you have so much more fun giving gifts than you do receiving gifts. Sure. And that's just where, where we're at. So I just feel like if I can give gifts out all the time, I'm, I'm in. I mean, as long as my family's taken care of and we can, you know, have a, a life, I don't, I don't need to live in mansions or anything like that, but just to do enough for the community where 
my kids can see that it's not about what dad got. It's about what dad's given back. And then I can pass it on to them. Now they're going to do that. And when I'm long gone, hopefully that keeps transferring over generation after generation. And I did my job. And when you think about it, I mean, when I first met the two of you, I thought you would almost be fierce competitors Mm -hmm. in a food industry where uh, Derek would probably like people to come buy the product from him and then feed your Super Bowl party with your product. And then, uh, of course, Sean, you having it already prepared meals for people, you would think in, you know, this crazy world we live in, the two of you really shouldn't even be speaking to each other, (laughs) (laughs) let alone working so well together. And then on top of all of that, giving back the way that you do. I mean, you are creating a legacy for yourselves. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's, I've, I've always been a huge, you know, when I talk to kids, it's easy to be negative. It's really easy to find the negative in things. It's hard to be positive and, and see the positive and everything. So Sean and I, we work extremely hard to be able to find that synergy that works between us. It's, it's hard. It's not easy. We have to make, but we have to rise each other up. And if we don't lift each other up, then who else is going to do it? Right. So we just have to continue to do that and not like we always say, and I'm sure everyone's sick of us saying it, but a rising tide does lift all ships. Mm -hmm. So if we can do it together, you know, we don't cannibalize each other and we make each other better then no one loses. Everyone wins. What do you guys think about integrity in the business world these days when everyone's looking for a shortcut Mm -hmm. and the fastest way to be the millionaire and have that beachfront home? How do you guys stay so down to earth in a world that just seems to be all consumed by having more and making more money, no matter what the cost is? Um, I mean, I, I can answer for myself, but I'm, I'm not driven by money anymore. I, I've I, probably for the past 10 years, I, money hasn't been my end game. So it's easy for me to, <clears throat> um, you know, really focus on what moves me. And when, when I found that, when I figured it out, it just came natural, you know, and then having a father who was always about giving back, who was always about, you know, helping this, the customers that came in and they didn't have an extra 10 bucks, but he would give them 10 bucks. Hey, you know, you go take that and feed your family. We're, we're good. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that, that really moved me. And so for me, it's just something that I've seen and it's, it's uh, been fun for me to, to watch my dad do it and then be able to take that over and, and find, the fulfillment in that Absolutely. yeah i think you know for me growing you know i was so fortunate my grandfather raised me in la jolla and was able to send me to the bishop school and they make us do 100 community service hours and those when you're a kid it's a, it's almost a joke you know you're trying to find any way you can to you know just get the hours done so that you can you know not worry about it but you know we did some projects where we went to the special olympics and we went and we planted trees and we did different things but it wasn't until really owning a business that you realize Community service is really something that you have to be doing 365. Um, if you want to be in business, if you especially here, in, you know, for us in Spring Valley, we opened in 2008. It's so difficult to keep a keep your doors open as a restaurant. Sure. Um, Was it the say one of the hardest? It's one of the hardest businesses. Business? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, for us, we just found that if we could give back just a little bit every single day, um, it would it would make an impact, you know, whether that was a local little league team or if it was a local church or a teacher's association, whatever that might be. And all those little things, they all add up and then they give you different opportunities where we can go and start doing something like, you know, a bigger barbecue event where we can celebrate what's happening in barbecue on the West Coast and have amateurs come out that, you know, they never really thought that they could could be in a contest, but then they come out and their family comes out and supports them and then they win an award and then they're crying and you're like, you know, this is really cool. You know, this is something that we created out of nothing, but now there's something that, you know, we can really celebrate every single year. I love how it starts small though. Yeah. Just giving back, starting with the little league team and your, the teachers associate, and then it snowballs. Sure. Well, you think about everyone wants to be so judgmental on the macro, right? Everyone's like, well, this fucking president's horrible and this person's a piece of shit and this and that. Well, why don't you start making a change in your, in your group? And be that person that's changing that little group. And that little group changes a little bit more. And then you start working on the micro, then your macro becomes a reality. So, you know, it's it's easy to look and say, well, how, how horrible it is. But like you said, you just start in your little community and try to f- make that better. You make that better and it can spread. You know, it's- and, and I feel like there's such a difference between the 
the hands and the feet and the servants of the community and the people that talk about doing something. Yes. It's the doers and the talkers. Sure. And are, you guys are the doers. Yeah. You're not the talkers. Well, I talk. Well, you know, you, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> we are your talking. <laughs> Today I mean, we're the, talking. The cool, the cool thing is you see it. I mean, you. it's not just Derek and myself. You know, we have so many amazing people in hospitality in San Diego that we strive to be like, you know, the Cohen Restaurant Group. I mean, there's so many amazing even single unit restaurant groups, barbecue restaurants that when asked to help, they were there to help. And, you know, for us, I guess the question kind of goes back to you. How do you in your job stay positive when you're getting bombarded and you're supposed to filter through what the community, what the stories are that you're actually reading every single day? That's such a good question because I feel like even as a parent, uh, when the news is on, I'm like flying for the remote to change the channel <laughs> no because joke. I have a five and seven year old at home, and yes. like I, you know, already the question since the seven year old can read what's ticking on the bottom of the screen, <laughs> yes. and he wanted to know what having an affair meant, and I'm like, okay, where's the remote? <laughs> yeah, that we have we have to do our part as journalists to make sure that the stories that are out there are important. You don't need to be a, I don't need to be the the trash truck, like unloading just junk on everybody Mm -hmm. every day. Like, how do we make sure that the stories we're telling really impact you or can help? Maybe you can help find the missing man or, or maybe you need to know about a crime to protect your family. So let's just make sure that the stories that we're telling are necessary for the public to hear. And we're not just unleashing negativity out there Mm -hmm. constantly. And that CW show that we have on our air now, because we're CBS and CW, it gives us an opportunity opportunity to do more and to connect with the community and to meet guys like you and other people doing great things and to share their stories. And we don't just have to be um, smacking people in the face with Mm -hmm. the latest negative thing that's going on. I don't want to be a part of that anymore. I want to be somebody who's helping to spread uh, important information and then share the stories of people in our community who are making a difference. Well, good for you, because that's that's really cool to hear. You know, we're Sometimes you get caught up in, in content, 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 right? I'm just give, giving in just an overload of information that's now I just wasted my time on an hour of information that I really didn't fucking care about. And, you know, to be able to give something that's really meaningful and that can help someone and impact them, I think that's important because it, it does get lost in the news. A lot of times I do the same thing. We don't even have cable anymore and we're not doing, we don't watch TV much anymore, but it's like, it's the same thing. It's like, I don't want to show my kids all this negativity all the time. There is a ton of positive things that go on. And if we can express and, and show that, that that's what's going on and those are the positive things, my kids will benefit from that. So it's just really, I mean, obviously you have to know about the, some of the, the bad things that happen. It's, it's life. <clears throat> but the more we can keep it positive, I think it's better for everybody. And the more you can educate people and not just, you know, suppress people and educate them and let them learn. I mean, that's, that's where it's at for me. Yeah, I 100% agree. And I do feel, I mean, you just mentioned, Derek, that you canceled your cable. Do you know how many people tell me that all the time? I'm like, oh gosh, what? <laughs> oh, <God. That's>, yeah. <laughs> are y'all hiring at the restaurant anytime soon? Because I might be filling out an application. Um, it, that's just what's happening in right. the world. People are, are pulling the plug and a lot of it's for financial reasons or they just don't need it, the, the format that it's been in for so long because we've got these phones in our hands sure. all the time and it's instant information. Mm-hmm. And I work for a company now, we just got bought out recently that understands that and says okay so they're going to their phones first Mm -hmm. let's serve them on the digital platform first yeah and that's that's going to be innovative that way it has to be i mean that's where everyone's going i get my news on my phone (laughs) i don't even get it on the tv anymore hopefully my boss isn't listening but (laughs) that's just the way that i'm getting it because i want it faster i don't i'm not waiting till five o'clock i know what happened all day or if you do you record it and then you can (laughs) you can go through it faster without without commercials so yeah so i think that understanding that and and that also gives people kind of a choice, you know, like you may see a headline like, I really don't want to hear about that. Right. I don't want to click on that. But there's another headline that maybe you are interested in. And when our station, our company is looking at what click, who's getting clicks and what people are focused on, it helps us determine what kind of news people want to hear. What the hell got you in to doing this? I mean, that's. I mean, how did you start? I mean, where did you grow up? Talk to us. So I grew up all over San Diego County. I think we moved 17 times. Really? Between my being born and graduating from high school. Wow. And at the time, I didn't think too much about it. But looking back, I'm like, how did my parents stay married as long as they did? Because <laughs> that's a lot of moving. That's too many, too many moves. Right. You yeah. know, I, I moved a couple of times, and it's just like a monumental task. <laughs> our last time, so, we're like, that's our last, last time move. ever moving. Yeah, right. And the last time my husband and I moved, 
um, I'm pretty sure we should have been in marriage counseling <laughs> during that because it was so stressful. Yeah, right. um, but we, I, I was born in Fallbrook, and uh, then we moved to Carlsbad, Benita, Chula Vista, up to Poway, and lived in five different houses in Poway before I graduated wow. from high school. So I kind of grew up all over the county. That's how I knew about Valley Farms Market right, right next to Benita Vista yeah. High School because we would shop in there sometimes. Absolutely. Um, and I was really shy. All growing up. Really? Yeah, I didn't, I wasn't one that would get up You didn't and say, I, I want to be on TV when you were... I liked the idea of the job, Yeah. but getting over and getting out of my head was the most difficult part Did you do acting in, in high no school? No acting. None? I took an acting class in college. It was a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really had no business doing this because I was so nervous, but it's like anything else, enough time and doing it every single day and you sort of work out the kinks and then after a while you don't think about it. Anymore, Do you think that so. you were as shy as you were because of you because of moving so much that you kind of just kind of stay secluded so people didn't, you know? P- perhaps, but I also think it was just in my nature yeah. to just be more of an absorber. Sure. And then that's I've learned that that's paid off. Because I just really am more curious in other people's stories than my own. Sure. So then that made me a better reporter where I sometimes feel like um, people on TV can't wait to get in their next question. Uh, And they haven't heard anything you said. As opposed to just sitting back and hearing other people's stories. And I genuinely am curious to hear how other people formed a business or... um, you know, each of you have like incredible life stories. I could spend an hour interviewing each one of you. And that to me, I think has helped because I've always been sort of an introvert and more curious about learning about others and having to tell everybody about myself. Did you have a mentor or somebody that kind of, you know, it was a certain point where you said, that's really something that I want to pursue in journalism. My mom kind of helped. Oh, really? Yeah. She was, um, you know, a mom of three kids and still found time to help each of us figure out what we wanted to be or do. In fact, I have an older brother who played football in high school and he was really big. And at the time they didn't have Amazon where you go order shoes from. So she drove <laughs> down to Chargers headquarters and said, my son wears size 15 or whatever he wears. Do you have any shoes? You know, things like that she Absolutely. would do. And they, thankful to the Chargers, right. showed up with some shoes oh, for wow. him. Cool. Um, and she took me down to Channel 10 when I was in either middle school i think just to watch the news one day the newscaster was nice enough to really answer her phone call and let us come down and from then i was super interested and hooked is it just took me a long time to stop being so dang awkward (laughs) 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 in fact i really am still very awkward Uh, no it's cool to hear about your mom we uh we strive to be those parents and you know my my goal is to never tell my kids what they have to be that I need to guide them on whatever they want and then help them achieve whatever goals they want to achieve. I think a lot of parents want to shove things down their throat. Like you have to do this, you have to do that. Like I don't, you know, if my kids want to come in here and, and be a part of the grocery store, open arms, you, you can do it. You have to work somewhere else for two years before you work for me, but you, you can, we can do it. Mm. Um, I like that. That's yeah. I, th- I think it will be, be important for them to be able to go see something else and then come back and see how rad it is to work for dad. Um, but it's, I think it's important to really focus on bettering your kids and not, you know, putting your agenda on them. If they want, I mean, my kid wants to be a ballerina dancer. We're going to be the best damn da- ballerina dancers there sure. are, you know, whatever it is. So it's, it's cool to hear your mom did that for you. How did uh, things, tell us a little bit about how CW, you know, closing down the station and uh, did you already have a job afterwards? Like so the transition I, period? I did sort of see that unfolding as mm-hmm. it was closing down about a year before it closed down. Um, my contract was up and either I stay and um, kind of fight through it, basically wondering if I was still going to have a job month to month or I find another job. So luckily CBS, which I'd worked at before as a reporter, I called the news director, Dean, who is probably one of the best news directors in the business, if not the best. He, it, yeah, I am saying that on purpose <laughs> too. <laughs> what, what, what makes Kidding. him such a good news, uh, news director? Because he gives you a long leash and he lets you fail if it's if you're going to make that mistake or he allows you to be creative and try new things and he's not down your throat about everything he's willing to let you be you and um and I appreciate that cuz so many news directors which is the boss of a newsroom in case people aren't really sure what yeah. that means um you know they run a tight ship 
and you're out of line and you're in trouble. And, you know, Dean's the first one that, oh, you, your kid's sick, go home, you know. Mm-hmm. And I appreciate people who, who see that balance between work and family mm-hmm. and then letting each individual be who they are and giving people opportunities too. He brought me back um, to give me an opportunity to do weather. I've never done weather. My name, Heather, rhymes with weather, and that's like all <laughs> I knew about weather when I took the job. But he gave me an opportunity to either figure this out uh, and do a great job and you work here or you don't. And then when an opportunity came up to be a sideline reporter a couple seasons ago for the Chargers during their preseason, I'd never done anything like that. I love football, but that's, you know, I'd never been a sideline reporter. And he let me figure it out and and do that for a, a small amount of time. So I appreciate that in, in a boss that gives people chances and not just hold you to one spot. Is there some opportunity that you're waiting for that you are curious about trying that you haven't done yet? There's a job open. <laughs> <laughs> and I put my name in the hat for it, and I'll keep you updated good, on it. Good, yeah. good. Please let us know when I you will. find I out the news. I absolutely will. Something you guys said earlier I kind of want to touch on real quick. When I asked both of you um, a little bit about integrity in the business, Derek, you said your dad. Mm-hmm. And Sean, you said your grandpa. And don't you think that sort of highlights the importance of strong men yeah, in sure. this world yeah. and men who are examples? And I just thought that that was such something that I really wish we would start to focus more on is like raising boys into strong men and then having those men be like prime examples for their own children. And what sure. a difference that's made for I mean, could you imagine where you would be without either of those two guys in your life? I, I think about it daily, but it's I don't always remember everything my dad told me but I always remember watching him and what he did. So you don't always learn by what they say to you, but you learn by, and you follow them. So him setting the example of going to work every day, working hard, creating a business, you know, staying focused, you know, those things are what I take, you know, that I'm so proud of. I, I don't know what weekends are. Everyone's always like, Oh man, I can't wait for the weekend. Well, what's a weekend? Like mm, when you're a business owner, there isn't one. Is my, there? Family, my, my stepdad, same thing. Very, very intelligent, uh, hardworking man who own business. He owns car washes, him and my mom. And it's, we don't know. I don't, I don't know what the weekend is. I don't know what time off is. I don't, everyone's like, man, I can't believe how much you work. And I'm like, I just don't know any different. Mm. This is my life and, and I'm 100% okay with it. It's what I chose to do. Like my, if my kids want to do it, but it's just what my dad and my, you know, uh, stepdad instilled in me. It's just hard work. Strap up your boots, go to work every day. Good things will happen. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, you know, what you said is highlighting the stories of parents, you know, people that are good fathers and people that are good mothers and even hardworking mothers like yourself. I mean, you have two young boys and you're not shy talking about it or posting about it on social media, but it's an important part of who you are as a mom, a working mom. Yeah. I mean, it's, they, they, it's funny when you have kids, you don't remember life before <laughs> kids. And so they've certainly, um, they're my whole world as you guys, you know, you're both fathers. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I do feel like raising the, I do feel like these days the focus is on girls a lot and raising girls and, and girls can be anything. And I wholeheartedly believe that I'm hundred percent back that, but I do feel like boys are lost in this a little mm-hmm. bit where like we need to be raising strong boys into strong men who are examples and we can, they, we cannot forget about them in yeah. this whole like me too movement and I, I, I have such a problem with that because I don't want boys to be all classified into one group where they have these great strengths. And how do we make sure that we sort of manifest those in guys? Oh, this is something you can talk about for for hours. I know, I've opened up this whole can of... No, no, absolutely. Because, I mean, it's it's not a negative to be a strong man. No. And you cannot be put down for that. And it's it's okay. And it's great to be a strong woman. I'm I'm all for that. You know, they talk about a lot of times... You know, this, uh, you know, women can do everything a man can do. And, you know, it's like, well, look, we're different and we should, it's okay to be different. And it's great that we're different. And I can't breastfeed a child. It, it won't, you won't try, work. It didn't right. It doesn't yeah. work. <laughs> I can't give birth. Those are the beauties that come with being a female. Like it's, and we should, we should say that's great and, and, and really highlight those things. And, and, you know, but when everyone just gets in, like you're saying, these movements, man, it's like, God, like, it's okay to be a strong, masculine man. 
it's not like you don't need to put someone down just because they're different than you. But, you know, you, you can still, you know, raise these people that are great people, you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I my kids are watching some different shows and the commercials come on and it's all about uh, strong women. And, and they look at me and said, Mom, I thought I was stronger than girls. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, you know, you are going to be when you're older, stronger than most women. And you know why? Because God made you to protect them and to protect your family. Yeah. So I'm going to celebrate that and not just slam them away with, yep, girls are just as strong as you. We're not. I mean, for the most part, we're not. No. And know? if you want to go in the in the cooler and start lifting up boxes, like, look, I need to do that. That's what I'm going to do. I don't need to. And can a woman do that? Absolutely sure. they can. But if you're going to put me up against that, 99% of the time, I'm going to be stronger. And it's just, it's fine. It's not wrong. She's going to be better than me at something that I can't do. And that's fine. You can highlight those things. But I'm 100% with you on that. I, I never understood why you, you want to suppress a, a strong man now and you're trying to push him down like it's a bad thing. Don't you know, I just don't get that shit. Yeah. I think it's just important to have the conversation. You know, it's important for, you know, us as fathers to talk about chivalry, to talk about being a gentleman, to talk about treating a woman right, but also to talk about strength and masculinity. Masculinity is not a bad thing, but it's also, you know, I was so fortunate that my grandfather and my grandmother, my grandmother's from Japan, you know, she taught me so many things just about respect and about being grateful and being thankful. And, you know, we had a a group, a, a husband and a wife, they came out for a charger game. They're from Japan, but they came out part of the Bolt Pride group and they had an amazing time. You know, we took pictures, we gave them t-shirts, but in the mail, two weeks later, I got this personal thank you card, you know, like probably the nicest thank you card I've ever wow. gotten from them. But that's just in Japan, you know, that's what they do. And the international aspect, I mean, I remember the World Cup, uh, Japan got knocked out and they got knocked out very, you know, they were they had high hopes, they got dropped out, very dramatic. And after the entire uh, Japanese team cleaned up every single piece of the locker room, like they didn't have staff clean it up, the players themselves cleaned it up and left a thank you note to the host country. Thank wow. you for having us. And like it went viral on, on the internet, but that's something that culturally we need to celebrate those different things in different cultures for our boys, you know, Absolutely. for our boys and, you know, now for my daughter as well. Yeah, for sure. Little so, girl on the way. I know, little girl on the way. Oh, man. So my, my son's going to have to learn how to, you know, look out for his little daughter little or his, his little sister. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, no, I mean. I mean Derek, Derek had sisters, so. Yeah, I have six sisters, but. Are you um, had six sisters? Yeah. The, Are you okay? Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, everything's great. I'm okay. I got. I have a buddy that he's kind of going through something that's, uh, you know, kind of what we're touching on and, um, you know, about playing with dolls and different things. I'm like, dude, I got dressed up like a fucking ballerina <laughs> for the first picture? 10 yeah. years of my life. <laughs> make, that's the real behind the yeah, smoke photo. <laughs> makeup on all the time. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's fine. Um, you know, it, it happens. Uh, but you know, Raising these strong kids is what we need to do. It's just what we need to focus on. Um, and I think, you know, we're all doing a, a great job. It's it's something to be celebrated. Yeah, I think if, if anything, especially taking away something from this conversation is maybe we don't have to know exactly what to do for them or with them, but know the example to set in front of them. Yeah. You know, because you mentioned that you didn't even really remember what your dad said, but you remember how he treated people and yeah. how he acted. And, mm -hmm. and that's what ultimately made sure. the impression. Yeah. yeah. And those, I mean, we've talked about it before on the podcast, but just simple things like how I treat my wife in front of my son mm -hmm. will actually impact how he treats women. You know, and that's something that I read in one of the 500 baby books I was supposed to read. <laughs> that um, your wife put on the nightstand she, for she you. Did, yeah. She did. I read them though. Um, but yeah, those are, th those are things that are, they're very important. You know, yeah, it's very absolutely. important. We well, get back to chivalry too. And you know, people are, you know, you open up a door for a woman. They're like, Hey, I can open my own door. I'm not saying Has you can't. Has somebody ever said that to you? Yeah. Stop it. Yeah. It was, um, I was going into a JC Penny and this, so this is probably a little while ago. Um, and I'm like, Oh, I'm not saying you can't, but if you were a guy walking up, I would open it for you too. Like sure. it's, it's not, I'm not saying it's a, a and you're, just and be, you're opening it in front of your boys so that they see that you open just the door be a nice person. <laughs> you, you're being I, a nice person. I don't get like, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to suppress you saying that you can't open this door. I'm just trying to open it for you, you know? And, but people just read into everything. Wow. And it's just such a, that is really disappointing to hear. Yeah. It's just such a, everything's so extreme in this world right now. It's like, this is the 
best or this is the worst service I've ever had. This is the best. It's like, look, not everything's the best or the worst or like, it's okay to be in the middle and have little things go on. It's not, not the end of the world, man. Mm. I would love, yeah. Talk to us about nuance and context. How do you get that in your stories when we live in such a sensational world where people want, I'm going to click yes, I'm going to like it, or I'm going to hate this. Mm. Like, how, how do you actually dig into the context of stories that you're sharing? You mean as, a, as opposed to looking biased yeah. on something? Um, that's a good question. And I think there are stories where we get to have an opinion on it. And I, I think that, you know, society as a whole has become a little bit more comfortable with journalists letting people know how they feel. I'm not, I'm not talking about politics. I'm not mm-hmm. talking about President Trump. I'm just talking about, you know, maybe how we feel about the slow iPhone update or something yes. a little softer, maybe easier to, to talk about. But at the same time, you know, we have a huge mirror being held up in front of this industry right now where we are looking at ourselves and and asking ourselves, are we covering stories in a fair manner? Are we being um, honorable in this profession? And, you know, I, I think that is necessary. I don't think that we should just, you know, tell everybody we're fair, we're fair. That's not flying anymore. Right. Yeah. And I just think that having people question this industry I'm sure it's hard when you're in the middle of it, but it's so necessary. And I appreciate people like really taking the time to dig into stories and saying, y'all didn't cover the other side of this. You're right. And we owe you an apology and we're going to get it right the next time. But I don't think that that's a bad thing that people really question um, the integrity of the media as a whole. I think it makes us better and it should make people better. Has there been any story that impacted you either on a positive side or on a negative side that you can remember? Um, As a whole? Gosh, I don't... Something that stayed with you for longer than usual? Trying to think. There's been so many stories over the years. I mean, you know, not to sort of kill the mood, but Sandy Hook, you know, mm-hmm. those types of stories, you know, mm-hmm. you don't you don't forget sure. those. You don't forget the video that's associated with stuff like that. Um, but and then a little closer to home, I, I remember interviewing this guy who had been wrongly convicted and spent like 25 years or 35 years or something in prison. Those are gnarly. And those are the craziest stories because they get out and they, it, it's like they've been in a time capsule. Yeah. And they're decades. institutionalized and it's yes. like, Jesus, man. And they don't recognize their own home. Because think of what changes over that. The streets change and buildings change and, you know, the way who was in charge changes. And um, th- those are just crazy st- And you don't get your life back. So <laughs> no matter if you're, are you happy years. you're released? I don't know. You yeah, know, like, yeah. what kind of questions do you ask somebody like that? So... Those that those are the kinds of stories that stick with me. Mm-hmm. Like and you that. covered the wildfires here in San Diego, right? My first day on the job, two thousand three, no was the wildfires wow. that happened. Um, the uh, I'm getting a mom mixed up. Is it the Cedar Fire yeah. from two thousand three? That was day one on the job for me. Day the last day on the job when I was at Channel Eight the first time around was the uh, the Witch Creek fires, mm-hmm. the 07 fires, and sifting through what was left of Larry Himmel's house was one of the last things I did. And then, um, and then of course, who would have ever thought that that would be like the new precedent? Like every time the fall comes around in Santa Ana's, we're going to have something that crazy. Yeah. At the time I thought, this is an anomaly. This will never sure. happen again. Right. It keeps happening. I know. Very scary. Yeah. I talked to my buddies that are firefighters and, you know, it's just out here. It's the, the dryness and everything. It's like, you're not going to be able to stop it. it it's, something that's going to continue to happen. And, you know, we have to figure out how to do better for, you know, cleaning out the brush and all that stuff. But, you know, costs a lot of money to do that. So, you know, who's going to do it? Who's going to pay for it? It's, uh, <clears throat> you know, you hate to see the things that happen like in Malibu. and But it's, you know, when those fires go, man, Mother Nature, she's no joke. And you can't just stop her, you know. It's one of those things that I used to surf all the time. And, you know, when you go out on a, on a day that's a lot bigger than normal and you're like, dude, like, you know, you're getting held under and, you know, she just, she does what she does and you cannot tell her, Hey, okay, time out. We gotta, we gotta readjust here. Yeah. It's, she just goes. So you have to respect it and, and try to be out in front of it. It's a, it's a tough thing. That's what's one thing that I felt uh, is so interesting about covering weather now is it, it's unstoppable. Yes. There's nothing that we can do. <laughs> right. There's no invention that's been made up that can change a weather pattern or stop rain on a, what's supposed to be a rainy day or stop a Santa Ana from moving in. So it's just well, like the, scar- the scariest things are the things that we don't talk about, which is the earthquake that will come. I mean, that that will come. And the fact that we don't know when it will come 
and we're on the fault line and we're right. going to be in a position where all we're going to have to do is do the best we can. But that's the one thing, you know, that even through the I remember the worrying about that a lot as a kid. As I remember a kid, being as like a terrified kid, of that happening. As a kid, happening. yeah, absolutely. And now as an adult, sure. I have like a laundry list of things I worry about. And that's like really gotten shoved down to the bottom. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry for bringing it back up. <laughs> so thanks to you, now it's like worked yeah, its way back. Like do an earthquake seven drill slot. with the kids. Yeah. <laughs> I remember earthquake drills. I was yeah. always so happy. Earthquake drills. We had to do an earthquake drill. We got to yeah. stand outside for a while and mm-hmm. it was like a whole new recess. We didn't have yeah. to be in school. <laughs> so I know. Meanwhile, I'm in the corner breathing in and out of a paper bag. You're so Celebrating recess. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what uh, What do you love most about your job? I like that it's something different every day. Yeah. You know, I, I think I would have a really hard time coming in and sort of doing the same job over and over and over. But I like that we get to interview different people every day. And I feel like you get an opportunity to become like a teeny mini expert in so many different subjects. So today we had on um, a woman who's doing her part to combat human trafficking and got to learn a little bit about her business. And then our Kyle Kraska is having a blood drive mm-hmm. for his, um, it's going to come up on four years since yeah. he went under that attack. And we, I got to talk to him and you know, I, I'm his coworker and I've been his coworker for a long time, but I never really got to have a conversation with him about all of that. Right. And that, um, another thing we, so something just different every day. And I like that about this job. You get yeah. to meet new people that's, all the time. Uh, that's Success. something I'm blessed with too. Like. You know, sometimes it's a blessing and a curse because you have to. We get to see like 800 people a day, and I'm like, oh man, I fucking hate people sometimes. But <laughs> sometimes it's really, really cool because the people that get that come in, you get to talk to them and learn their story, and and it's uh, the even though what we do is sometimes monotonous, but being able to talk to people and they have different stories every day, it's it's pretty cool to listen to them. You've been able to interview some big time celebrities. Any of them that you were nervous about? Oh, they're all. I'm always. I'm nervous right now. Can <laughs> you remember going back to Aquaman? <laughs> um, so a lot in, of anybody them in are, particular though that you were really we excited about? We got to interview Garth Brooks a couple yeah, of weeks ago, that. and that was super cool. A lot of the big name celebrities are via satellite, uh-huh. so they're sitting in a chair somewhere in the world, and they get a news station every three minutes checking in to ask them oh, questions. Wow. So sometimes by the you know by the time they get to the west coast they're over it yeah they don't want to talk <laughs> no more anymore. questions and here i am like bouncing in and all excited and gonna ask him things and and they could care but he was cool Garth Brooks yeah. was cool he was enthusiastic and excited to be on and that was I'm before sure... notre, the notre dame concert yeah i was it. Yeah. talking about his huge concert at notre That's dame awesome. yeah so that he's was really he's cool. extremely good too i mean just uh you know, when he did his Las Vegas and his last one, like th- his storytelling within his concert was just so, I mean, it, you just, everyone would just gravitate to it and you couldn't, you couldn't turn away. It was, he's, he's, <laughs> he's damn good at what he so does. He's born to be a performer. Yeah, yeah, he really was. Yeah, he's just, he's the man. Is there any colleagues that you respect that kind of helped you along the way or they taught you something that you didn't know when you were coming up? You know, there's so many that have done unnecessary favors for me or helped me out in ways that you know I could never repay I remember when I first was working in the business I was a writer at NBC here in town and there was an anchor there named Suzanne Rico and she was the weekend anchor and I was in college like barely working there a couple of days a week And I told her that I wanted to be on TV and she kind of took me under her wing and she actually gave me some of her business suits. So I would have a suit to wear in order to shoot an interview tape to get my first job. And I showed up at my first job with only the two suits (laughs) that she'd given me because that's all I could afford at the time. And I look back, I thought, how cool was that? That she went into her closet and dug out some clothes to help somebody else who, I mean, this is a weird business who could very well someday sure. take her job. I mean, sure. I didn't. And, you know, she moved up and moved to L.A. and did great. But that's that was just so awesome. How was that first inter- that first audition tape? Horrendous. I would love to find it. <laughs> yeah, I would love to find that. <laughs> it's not on YouTube. If you do, so, if, if you and do how find it works it, in this business is you, you move to small markets and you uh-huh. get started. So you make all your mistakes in, like, little towns. And then you get it in the next market up, the next market up. I... It will like never be able to show my face in Yuma, Arizona, because <laughs> I was so bad at first on television. I mean, I'm talking forget my own name, forget what I'm talking about in the middle of a live shot, just freeze deer in headlights, not once, but like every day until I finally figured out how to do it. Yuma's a special town. We used to go to Yuma or travel through Yuma. <clears throat> we go to the, the river all the time. Oh, yeah. And uh, Yuma's definitely a... 
a special <laughs> special place to <laughs> to say the least. And I know yeah. I know you go and you do a lot of giving back where you're talking to students. What are you? Uh, what's the main message that you're typically telling them? I always tell people that it doesn't take an enormous amount of talent to do whatever whatever they want to do in life. I mean, okay, brain surgeon, fine. That's sure. that you need an enormous amount of talent to do that. Um, but for most professions and for most jobs, it's just showing up day after day after day and be willing to listen and learn. And over time, I don't care what it is you want to get good at, it's going to happen. You, if you want to be a good basketball player, spend a couple hours outside every single day shooting hoops. I guarantee you, you're probably going to make the team in a year. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel like there's a magic or a secret recipe or anything to to have success in this world. I just feel like it's just time and the willingness to show up and get it done. I, you're 100% you're right. It's We live in a world of instant gratification. So instant, every, yeah. Everyone wants it right now. I, well, I want to I wanna do what you're doing. I want to be, you know, well, it, it doesn't happen that way. <clears throat> and sometimes we get lost in... Um, enjoying the process of things that you know going through it and you know we'll talk about it sometimes but it's you know looking back at, at some of my favorite times were at the time some of the times i thought were the worst you know but i look back i'm like dude that was so fucking cool that we did those you know at kansas state we we practiced for a whole day straight you know people were like oh i had two days i'm like pitch you have no idea what <laughs> we, we practiced for for 10 hours straight and but it was like i hated it in the moment but looking back now i'm like dude that i mean that i became a man then mm -hmm. that's that's when that you know i i always tell people when i moved to college i went to kansas i left as a boy i my mom I'm a Hispanic family, so my mom and, and sisters kind of did everything for me. I didn't, I didn't do my laundry, didn't do cook or clean. I did nothing, you know, just played sports. So going out there and being on my own and, you know, every morning being up and, and working out and doing this and being on a, on a structured, you know, uh, timetable. And we, uh, you know, if you were five minutes early, you were, you were basically late. We called it cat time. But learning those lessons, I became a man. In, in five years, I became a man when I went to Kansas State, and people look back and they don't like the coach because he's very militant, and um, you know I don't think that he was uh, the great greatest person, but he was a great coach and, and taught you life lessons, and I became better because of him. So you know you just trust the process when you're in it because it does take time and it's not going to be just instant. And for you, I mean, I don't want to speak for you, but don't you think that it was showing up? early in your case yeah. and putting in the time and trying your best and keeping your ears open to the coach's direction that pushed you into the NFL. Yeah. I mean, I know you were a talented football player, but just being present puts you ahead of a lot of other people who thought, I don't want to, I don't want to play for that coach cause he's too tough. Absolutely. It's I've talked to people about it all the time. It's I would, there was people always that were bigger, faster and stronger than sure. me. always, but no one was going to outwork me. And no one was going to study more film than me. And I would just do it. And I would know I, this guy's going to take his first step here. He's going to be pulled. He's light on his hands. He's going to do this. But it was just the amount of detail that we we put the time and effort into it. It's like, look, I, if he if he can just beast me and, and pick me up and throw me, well, okay. But that I mean, that's probably not going to happen either. But I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna know what's going on. I'm and I'm gonna be making sure that I'm there every single day. And if you beat me next play, guess what? I'm right here. Right. Let's go again, you yeah. know, and it's always just coming back and wanting it. And, you know, I, <clears throat> you know, David Goggins talks about taking souls and I really, really can relate to that. Like I, I couldn't wait to get to the fourth quarter because I knew he was tired and I knew he didn't want to be here and I'm going to fucking hit him in his mouth again and he's not going to want it. And you can see when they break. And for me, it was just something that kind of disgustingly gratifying that I knew, like, I just broke you. Like you can't, you can't do it. Cause I'm just going to keep coming every single time. And it's like you said, I'm going to show up every single day show when these up. other people are going to quit and they're not going to want to come back. I'm going to show up and guess what? The owner or whoever is going to pay attention to that. They're like, that kid's got it. Like, you know, and they're going to move him up and they're not going to suppress him. They're going to try to give him whatever he wants. That That's a big, big lesson. It's a showing up thing. It's, yeah. like you mm -hmm. said it earlier. You said it's a time and effort thing. It's not always a talent thing. No, it's a absolutely time and an not. effort thing. Absolutely not. And, you know, uh, there's some people that are extremely talented. I mean, some of the best ball players I ever played with were at my high school. And, uh, you know, they were into gangs and mm -hmm. violence and all that stuff and uh you know it's unfortunate that they just uh they didn't want to put in the time and effort either to to the right things and they they were you know went the other way so but it, it really is just show up 
positive attitude and work harder. Be the hardest working person in that room right. every single day. You'll get noticed. Yeah. yeah. Without a doubt. Absolutely. You'll get, it'll pay off. It just takes forever, but it does <laughs> right. happen, right. you know. <laughs> well, yeah, I think one of the coolest things about showing up and working hard is that it allows you to have opportunities, you know, and for us to have an opportunity to be podcasting with you, who we respect so much and who we've watched before we developed a professional relationship to the point where we invited you to come to the Turf and Surf Barbecue Championship. Which was awesome. Asked you to be a celebrity uh, Kansas City Barbecue Society judge. Um, and how was that experience for that you? That was so awesome. Yeah. I don't know what I was walking into that day. <laughs> I just figured I was going to go around to a bunch of barbecues and like sample something here and then you know that is part of the event obviously yes. but the judging part man you guys take that seriously yes. i mean you have rules and regulations and um i never seen anything like that but that was such a cool experience yeah i think for us you know being you know organizing professional barbecue contests that our kansas city barbecue society sanctioned it's important that the media that the relationships that we've had but that you guys get to go and see how serious this Kansas City Barbecue Society really is. I mean, 500 events that they put on worldwide, but these teams that are competing for, you know, $15,000 in cash and prizes, they take this very seriously. And so do the judges. You know, you you were there with Tabitha Lipkin and you guys, you know, we were making jokes and the, you know, I had um, Gene and, and Kelly Kat McIntosh. They're both like, hey, stop taking pictures, Sean. And I'm like, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm playing around. Oh yeah, they somebody came over and pulled the camera out from us because uh, <laughs> they <laughs> they we I guess you can't and your napkin has to be on a certain mm -hmm. side and you mm -hmm. you know I just was amazed the whole yeah. thing was amazing. So you ready, you ready for round two? I was gonna say, do I have to invite myself? Oh no, yeah, the, no, take. you're okay. you're uh, you're you're definitely in for round two. Okay, uh, good. Because now I know like a. Old so that'll problem. be. Now, yeah. now you're pretty much professional. So right, that's exactly. And easy. I'd like to be around for more than just the tri tip round. <laughs> they right. had other things they were testing. <laughs> yeah, I wanted... Looks so good. Yeah. <laughs> so, how uh, how do our listeners, how do they uh, find you on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook? So, Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, yeah, we're, I'm pretty much. Heather News uh, 8. Uh, Heather Myers TV on Instagram, and it, it may even be the same on Facebook. And then I think Heather News 8 on Twitter. Perfect. And we will see you on Friday. Oh my gosh, I right? can't wait for you guys to come in. By the out. way, here you go giving back again on Friday yes. on our channel. Yes. Y'all are giving away like a catered Super Bowl meal. Absolutely. For how many people? 25 people. For 25 people. Probably feeds about 30, yeah. Man. Yeah. Whoever wins that is stoked. They're going to not have to do any work. They can I just have a party that. and enjoy the game. So we get to give away yeah, one of your guys' catered meals this week on the show. So that'll be fun on Friday. So for us, we uh, we just have a quick social shout out for those listening to the show and tagging us, uh, hashtag behind the smoke. Um, Francie Bakes, she got together, she's from Denver, and she got together this SoCal Instagram happy hour, which she's already been a social shout out winner, but all the people that came, I mean, the fact that she organized this from Colorado to have the party with Derek and myself over at Cali was really cool. Um, but this this week, it's going to go to at Brewbeer, um, Ashton, his wife, Beth, she came out and uh, their son, Arthur. They had a great time. I know um, Big John Brand, he's the one that invited them. But we had just a bunch of amazing people that came out that either listen to the podcast or they participate in Spring Valley Barbecue Festival or they want to come out to Del Mar. Uh, but we're grateful that you guys listened to the podcast. We're uh, grateful that Heather came and spent no, some time with us. thank you. I feel so and, grateful um, for this opportunity. Yeah, please uh, please follow her on social. Let her know uh, what you thought about the podcast, and we will check you guys next week. Well, one more thing. Um, if you guys you know are listening, you guys ever listen to the Brody's Burgers and Beer oh, yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> um, episode, um, a guy who's like a father figure to me, Craig Broderick, uh, got in a skiing accident and um, – you know, was uh, paralyzed for a little while and is um, on the road to recovery up in Utah. So um, <clears throat> if you guys can send some positive vibes his way, he's, uh, you know, doing well, um, has broken vertebrae and um, little mobility right now, but they're, they're working on it. I know how strong he is. So, you know, he knows we love him. I talk to him and his wife every day. So um, send positive vibes his way. Yeah, love them. All right. We'll see you guys next week.